there has is nothing in like crisis to point out the vulnerabilities in the system. And I think certainly one of the vulnerabilities that we're seeing is uh, the inequities in a system when public education is shut down, or at least public schools are shut down. I think the inequities are, are becoming pretty well defined for us. Um, our role is not clear yet. The role of the legislature is not clear yet what we can do. Um, we're going to be hearing uh, regularly from the uh, superintendents, the school boards, the principals, the teachers, we're gonna be hearing from them, the, the special ed uh, administrators uh, weekly to get an update. I'm also working to get a week from the agency um, as to what their needs will be. Are there things that they need, will need from us? Um, I am really happy that Laura Soros um, from BISPIT is here um, to help us understand some of the risks that schools are, are addressing, um, some of the work that you've been doing during this period of time to just give us an update. So welcome, Laura. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. So I'm going to uh, read, so I'm sorry I'm not making eye contact, but thank you to uh, Chairperson Webb and the committee for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Laura Soares. I am the president of the Vermont School Board Insurance Trust. We are a member program. So many, um, in fact, most of the schools in the state are members of one or both of our programs. And I wanna to talk to you about some of the risks and worries that we're addressing related to COVID ID, uh, excuse me, COVID-19 and our programs. <clears throat> so we have an unemployment program we have about 140 members in that program. And our worries in the area of unemployment is that as being a member of our program, they do not pay into the state unemployment fund. They don't have a set rate. They pay a much lower rate into Visbit's unemployment program. We um, have a cost savings to districts in that way. We actually also charge them based on three years of claims that helps schools budget and smooth their unemployment expense. And we've had some experience with unusual unemployment claims back in 2008 in the recession. So there's a couple of things that we're paying attention to and um, dealing with in that program. We do expect that schools will have un increases in unemployment claims, even while most school employees stay employed because school districts as other employers are responsible for claims for five quarters, so a year and a quarter. So there will be people who left the school district sometime in the last five quarters who are unemployed now because of the COVID-19 situation. And those claims are in part the responsibility of school districts. In 2008, half of our additional claims came from those uh, employees, people who left the district prior to the crisis, but the district is responsible for paying some unemployment claims. So that's something we're watching. The other thing that um, we've noticed in the new law, I believe in H742, which is on the governor's desk, is that people who voluntarily leave employment in this crisis will be eligible for unemployment benefits. Now we understand why that's being done and that it makes sense, but that will increase the number of employees or people who are subject to unemployment claims. And we reimburse those ourselves. So we don't expect that we will have any relief from the state or federal government, but those claims will still be the obligation for school districts. Um, we're also paying attention to the federal government's increase in unemployment benefits that are available to people because of COVID-19. And again, the way our program works is no matter what the claim is, if someone is eligible, we pay it out of our funds. We did not get any relief from the state or federal government in the recession, and we don't appear to be eligible for any relief from the federal or state government in this period. 
Now, our program is actually very well funded. We have significant reserves that we have kept in place for the last several years. And we believe that we will be able to pay these claims out of our reserves without increasing rates to school districts. But depending on the scope and the length of time this goes on, eventually we may have to raise our future rates and that could impact school budgets. So that's the things that we're following in the unemployment program. And I can pause there or go into other areas. Uh, Chairperson Webb, I don't know if you have questions at this point. Are there questions from the committee? Is it my system that's breaking up a little bit or Laura's going a little bit going in and out for me? Is it, is it for everybody? No, just for me, okay. So our second program is our multi-line program. And we have um, 47 of the supervisory union supervisory districts in that program. And our liability program um, covers things like workers' compensation and all of the different liability property uh, coverage, including we defend IEP um, claims for school districts. Now, foremost, we are concerned about the education of children, the health and safety of school employees, trying to help everyone through this crisis. We also recognize that a lot of issues um, and questions that are unique to this crisis and school districts need clear and quick answers. So one of the things that VisBit has done in um, conjunction with this superintendents association is convened a group of education attorneys that are working with the agency of education trying to identify what are the questions school ha schools have, how do we get them clear, concise answers in a timely way, making sure that safety is front and center and making sure that schools are continuing to provide the free and appropriate public education. I'm gonna talk about three areas, all of which were touched on by the people who testified last Friday in front of the committee. So school safety. Schools are striving to meet the needs of their students in an environment that has less controls and safeguards for those who are most vulnerable. There's gonna be many one-to-one -one virtual interactions on platforms and video conferencing, Google Hangout, Zoom, personal devices, telephones, things that um, and methods that haven't been widely used before. The concerns that have come up range from student data privacy, FERPA compliance, HHB oversight and compliance, which is still the responsibility of schools and overall safety. Just last week, the FBI issued a memorandum about school closings due to COVID-19 and increased potential risk of child exploitation. The FBI are war warning parents, educators, caregivers, and children about the increased risk of exploiting our children online in this environment. And schools have to figure out how to navigate this new dynamic. As distance learning plans are being developed, our hope is to get information out to the field so they understand this balance that they must strike between having to have regular contact with teachers and students and meaningful contact and make sure it happens in a safe, appropriate and supportive manner. Sexual abuse and molestation claims are one of our highest potential exposures. And it's an issue that's been um, prominent around the country in the last year or two, especially. So that's an area that we're trying to help schools think about, again, with the consultation of a team of education attorneys so that they can try to address these issues appropriately. Special education is another area of liability. And I know Aaron McGuire has spoken to you on this. Students and families have educational rights and protections under federal law that school districts are still required to adhere to but IDEA was not written for this environment. Our educational attorneys have specialty, um, special ed experience, and they're collaborating again with the Agency of Education to identify what the issues are. The attorneys are meeting weekly with folks at the agency and trying to develop creative solutions. 
We don't know yet to what extent we'll see an increase in claims against school districts for failure to provide services by an IEP, but we're hoping that hearing officers and agency officials will take into account the limitations that are created by distance learning for all students, not just students with disabilities. In the meantime, we're trying to focus on identifying the questions and getting uh, answers, resources, and tools into the hands of educators as quickly as possible. And the final area that uh, we're paying attention to is the labor and employment area. School districts as employers are functioning in extraordinary and fluid times. State and federal laws, the employment laws that have always been in effect, local bargaining agreements, um, and school districts nature as employers are not structured to easily adapt to this wide ranging and evolving issue. Visbit and its attorney group has been offering general guidance, but in the final analysis, superintendents have to be guided by the collective bargaining agreements, the executive orders that Governor Scott has given, and guidance documents from the Agency of Education and Vermont Department of Health. They have to seek advice from their legal counsel and try to maintain the employer-employee relationship that has been established through previous decisions. For many school districts, the supervisory union is one of the largest employers in the region. Liability issues associated with labor and employment are things like wrongful termination, harassment, and access to the state and federal leave programs, or lawsuits from parents claiming that their educational services are not provided in a sufficient way. We're worried, especially if we have limited staff due to the conditions that staff are dealing with at home or their own illness. So these are the big areas that we're paying attention to. And again, there's a lot of unknowns at this point, um, but we're working closely with all parties to try to help navigate this new environment. Thank you. Um, Representative Matos and then Representative Codlin and, oh, Matos does not have a question. So Representative Conlon and then Representative James. Uh, Laura, going back to um, uh, uh, the unemployment uh, issue. Um, so you're, you're basically a self-funded unemployment benefit provider. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought the federal, the, the federal um, stimulus package, whatever you want to call it, was going to assist with nonprofits who were self-funding their unemployment benefits. Does Visbit not fall under that or am I wrong? Well, we have no information yet to know for sure where we fall. Um, in the past, when the state and federal government didn't build in the recession claims into employers' future rates, that does not apply to reimbursable employers. I mean, I know one of the things the federal government's trying to do is to provide loans to small businesses so they don't have to lay off employees and have them go on unemployment. And again, we're not expecting wide unemployment from school so right now laying people off. We're more looking at those people who have been employees in the past that are attributed back to school districts as the employer. And we will certainly make sure that any benefits under the federal law accrue to us and our program if we're eligible. But it's reading the federal language at this point, it is not clear that we have that eligibility. Okay, thank you very much. Representative James. Yeah, thank you. I had a, a similar question following along. Um, I, I don't think I understood the um, uh, the five quarter um, description that you gave, I, how I understood that was that the, the, the Visbit policy basically is portable and follows a person to another job, even if it's not in the school system for five quarters. I, I didn't understand, sorry. Sure, so when someone goes on unemployment, their unemployment cost is assigned back to the, the, an employer. And it, they look back for 15 months. So one year plus another three months. 
So if we have someone that left the school district, for example, last June 30th, they didn't get reemployed with the school district, they went to work somewhere else, they are now laid off because of COVID-19, the school district still has a responsibility to help pay for that unemployment claim. If they get laid off within 15 months after leaving the school district, the school district is partially responsible for their unemployment costs in the future. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Good question, thank you. Others? So it sounds to me, Laura, like there's a lot of things that are still in the process of opening up um, yes. that we, we don't know yet what the actual impacts are going to be, but you are looking ahead to see that they will definitely be coming forward. I know I think we're all pretty concerned about um, our, our students with disabilities and access, uh, which is a, a significant challenge when the school is closed. Um, so we will definitely be standing by on that. Are there other questions or concerns? Did you did you raise your hand on your little your little app? <laughs> I, I see it, but I'm trying to get you ready, Sarita. <laughs> I can't find the little hand. So anyway, I have to get my son back up here. Um, just a couple of questions. One is, I'm wondering. Um, about a timeline or benchmarks that you can keep us uh, informed as to in terms of funding or you know if you're getting close to not being able to fund um, unemployment claims like how will you keep that you know our committee updated um, on how things are going the second is I'm just wondering, and I'm not trying to create more paperwork for anybody, but I'm wondering how special educators are documenting, you know, doing a really good job of documenting their efforts to implement um, IDEA. And I also asked Aaron this question, is the federal government at all uh, considering uh, revising the requirements uh, for special ed? for IDEA during this time, specifically just until the executive order, the federal order is lifted. Because it seems like it's just, I, there are sometimes I just can't even figure out how you would deliver the, you know, the um, write-ups in the uh, IEP. I, I just can't figure out how that can happen in this, in this time. And I think Aaron is the one who needs to speak to the special ed issues and is most familiar with what's happening at the federal level. I know it's a concern across the nation. Um, again, what our program does is if a school district does have a lawsuit that they have not followed the IEP, we will defend them for that. And documentation helps with defense, obviously, right. because everyone who has good intentions, and I believe everyone does have good intentions at this time, uh, you know, we want to recognize those those good intentions. We will certainly keep the committee updated if we start to see an uptick in claims or worry about um, unemployment claims. This is going to take a while to play out. And again, both of our programs have appropriate reserves, especially for a time like this. But eventually, as you deplete your reserves, you have to rebuild them. So we're not imagining right now that the budget impact is gonna hit schools in the next year or maybe even two fiscal years, but eventually um, you know, we need to maintain funds to meet the needs of the program of our member schools and we will do that. But we will keep you updated, absolutely. Thank you. I will say, Representative Austin, that I um, I spoke with um, General Counsel yesterday uh, about the, this issue. I do believe that they may have posted guidance, uh, special ed guidance on the AOE website. Um, I have not looked at it yet, and I, as I understand it, if we can if we can get the AOE in next uh, Thursday, perhaps they can speak to this. I believe that they are. Um, they are looking to see if they can at least get waivers on some of the paperwork um, so they can focus more on kids and not on um, special ed paperwork. But, but that'll be a really good question for the AOE as well. 
I, my understanding is that they did not, the federal bill did not do some of the things that um, that folks would have wanted from the, from the district that, that Aaron spoke about. Anything else? Laura, thank you so much uh, for coming in. Um, I'm sure that, that this is a, a pretty heavy time for your organization. Well, thank you, and I appreciate all of your work. Thank you. Okay, um, let's just take, we'll cut five minutes for the um, other folks to come in. Um, we have, oh no, we don't, excuse me. We're gonna have Jim. Jim is gonna start talking with us about the bills. This we're, What we're gonna look at right now is the bills that um, have come over from the Senate um, see, just get an idea that uh, sort of a, a, a high level view of the, the aspects of these bills. And then for, for us, for our committee, look at those things that look like they're um, things that, that are relevant to the situation that we're in, one or two are really in the must pass or three perhaps needs, need to wait another year. Um, and we won't be voting yet. We might just do a, you know, a straw polls, but we won't be do, doing any voting this week on any bills. We're not really set up for that quite yet. So um, Jim, Jim Array, we have five bills it looks like we're gonna be looking at. And the first one is S224. Um, these bills, these bills all have um, act names that don't necessarily relate to what the bills are doing now. So um, let's start with S224. Okay. Um, okay, so for the record, uh, Jim Damore, Vice Consul, we are walking through um, S224, uh, which is um, the miscellaneous edu education bill that was voted out of Senate education it has not moved from there that I know of. So it's not gone to the Senate floor yet. Um, so if we can scroll down, Avery, a bit. Uh, the first uh, few sections you'll be familiar with because um, section one deals with uh, the closure of uh, post-secondary schools and how to deal with student records. So uh, this was in the miscellaneous bill last year uh, and you and the Senate Education Committee both have versions of this, which were very uh, similar to each other. Um, so this looks quite fuzzy on my screen. Can people see this? That's better, yeah. Um, so my question for Chair Webb is, do you want me to walk through this or just go through the bill section by section first and give you a sense of what's in it? I'd be inclined to just say, these are the topic headings that the bill is going to like, for example, you know, in the first three sections, the AVIC bill, okay. we could sort of view it that way first, I sure. think it'd be helpful. Okay, if we can scroll down then, Avery, um, to section two, which is just part of the same theme. Um, keep going. And keep going. Right there. Uh, section two is just a transition se uh, section to require AVIC to uh, amend its memorandum of understanding. So it goes with section one. If you can scroll down further, section three, a bit further. There you go. Uh, so there's a requirement in, um, uh, go up a little bit, Avery, if we could. Um, is there a requirement uh, in law today that superintendents and principals take an oath and that's been, being repealed uh, in this bill? That was also in the miscellaneous bill of last year, at least the Senate version of it. So we're all of these sections. This is, this is our, our um, private uh, institutes of higher education that uh, were closing. Are all, are all of these similar to bill that we passed last year? Yes. Okay. So we, we've already looked at these. We've already passed it. It's just showing up again in this bill. Well, this is the Senate version. There'd be very minor differences from what you, you did last year. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, I think maybe they're almost identical now, actually. Um, but very, very close. Okay. And do you remember what bill that is in? Because we have a miss. We have. It, it, don't do it now, but if, if you could help us know how this relates to a bill that I think is. I think last year's miscellaneous bill was H-164. H nice work. <laughs> I think. H-164, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, Avery, if, you, if we could scroll down to section four. Uh, this was in the last year too. This is small school support. And all this does is it fixes a technical issue, um, which was part of law, uh, but that law got updated uh, in July of 2019. Um, and this language is not part of the updated law now, but should be. So this is basically taking pre-K students out of account for small school grants. So if you start a pre-K program, you won't disqualify yourself from small school grants because of pre-K students. So that's what this does. Was this in a bill last year or not? Or is this yeah. anywhere else? Yep. Okay. And then uh, section five, Avery, if you could scroll down. This is new language. Uh, so this is on wellness programs. Um, so this is doing a few things. This is um, uh, revising current statute to uh, expand the definition of a wellness program from uh, just uh, fitness and nutrition to that plus comprehensive health education, which is a much broader field. Uh, um, and it requires, importantly, uh, if you scroll down um, to, yeah, keep going, sorry. Uh, scroll down to section six. It requires that the school wellness policy, which now includes a broader definition uh, be updated um, uh, and dis distributed to school districts. Um, so that's what this is doing. So this is basically requiring that school districts have a best practice approach to its wellness programs. And then section seven, um, this was in your uh, language Either last year or two years ago, this is the one for, I believe, uh, Rep. Giamatista's district. Um, so this is the one that deals with elections for unified school districts and uh, talks about um, uh, how you deal with um, uh, electing members of the board uh, and filling vacancies uh, and basically having that be, being done by the school district and not by the select board. Um, get input from the select board, but not uh, having them control uh, the um, election. Okay, so, and this was in a, we, we passed this. Passed it, it's sunset, and now it's being put back in place for another, another year. Okay. Again, this is all pending, hopefully at some point, uh, Don Rousseau Savage's uh, cleanup of uh, title uh, or section. Um, right. Whole, whole area around uh, Union Chapter School. 11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we move on to section eight, this came over from the agency. It deals with a very specific and technical issue, which is what happens when a Union School District has a member that itself is a Union School District. And how do you work the mechanics of um, uh, of voting elections uh, because usually you're relying on the select board in the town, but now the member is not a town, but it's another union school district. So it's basically looking through the member union you know, school district to the member towns to perform those functions. It's a very mechanical issue, um, but that's what that addresses. And this would, is another thing that would norm, normally be fixed if we had gotten to chapter 11. Correct. And it's got a sense of in a year again. Okay. okay. So the, the, these two things, section seven and eight then are really uh, just getting us through another year. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then section nine deals with um, making menstrual hygiene products um, both available um, in K through 12 schools. Um, 
uh, in a manner that doesn't embarrass the uh, student. Um, so uh, the purpose, if we can scroll up for a second, uh, Avery, to subsection A, uh, just to read the purpose here, uh, intends to ensure that a female student attending a public school or an improved independent school, let me scroll down a bit, Um, has access to menstrual hygiene products at no cost and without the embarrassment of having to request them. So this language here basically requires that schools stock its, um, its bathrooms used by female uh, students in grades five through 12 um, with um, fem 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 feminine hygiene products. Um, okay, if we scroll down, Further, uh, now we get into special education. Uh, and this, these are the changes that are required uh, in order to make Act 173 function properly. So let me pause here for a second. Um, last year, you recall at the end of the session, the effective date for the new census grant funding change was pushed out by one year. Um, to July 1, 2022, I believe. Um, I can't remember, but uh, one year out. But there are a number of date changes within the language of uh, statute that weren't changed, that have to change to make the statute work. So there are a number of dates that didn't get moved last summer, but should have been moved. Um, so I won't go through all that in detail now, but the two things this, these sections are doing is moving dates uh, to conform to that date change, and two, making technical changes requested by the Agency of Education um, and very small technical things. So I won't go through all this with you now, but there are four or five sections here that deal with those two themes. And the problem of, of postponing this another year uh, it is significant then. Sure, because 173 cannot operate effectively without these changes. Um, so if we scroll down quite a ways, Avery, to keep going until you, yeah, keep going. I can tell you when, when. Yep, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Jim, how about a page number? Uh, right here, good, stop. Uh, I don't have I don't have the uh, documents printed out, so I'm not sure what the what the page number would be. I do. So if you get get to the to the area, I can let you know what okay. it is. Um, so you are on page uh, fifteen. 15 um, and um, fifteen uh, deals with gen gender balance on the UVM and Vermont State College boards. Uh, so it recognizes that the uh, UVM board as an overwhelming majority of men. Uh, the BSC board has gender balance currently on the board and this sets a, sets a goal, goal for the UVM board to achieve gender balance by 2025 uh, and maintain it and for the BSC board to maintain its current gender balance. So if we scroll down further, Avery, page 16. Um, so that's what the section does. Um, then scroll down further, if you would, um, to the next section. Okay, stop here, if you would. So uh, I can't see the page number, but this is uh, section 16, and this is on proficiency-based education. And it's basically an appropriation. Um, so it recognizes that, um, uh, that there's already an appropriation to fund projects that focus on uh, proficiency efforts. And it's, um, Section subsection B here is appropriate four hundred thousand dollars for that purpose. Okay, it's not prescriptive in terms of requiring um, changes in in proficiency based education. Just uh, providing some funding uh, to to um, facilitate some further work in this area. Okay, and then the last section is the effective date. So if you scroll down a bit further, um, that's there, and then as it passes of the bill. 
that will be um, an actor aid to making miscellaneous changes to education laws. So, um, Jim, I, I noticed that this bill, I believe, is, is currently in uh, appropriations because it has a $400,000 um, appropriation in it, which means that this bill, therefore, we might want to be looking at the items that we should pull out of this, and um, this is, you know, to the committee to think about as well, pull out the items in here and um, pull forward the miscellaneous ed bill that we have on the wall and uh, you know, strike that and, and address the things that we know we're gonna need to pull out of this bill that, that we don't wanna get stuck in ways and means, in, uh, in appropriations. Can you pull a bill off the wall now that you go back to? We have a bill that was passed by the Senate. Oh, from last year. From last year. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a vehicle. That's a miscellaneous ed bill. It's a vehicle yeah. that would be an appropriate place to, to work I, with. I think it's S-164 or something. I'll, we'll yeah, look it up. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, Peter, you have a question. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, do you know, did the Senate take additional testimony on the AVIC college closings issue? Did they take, if they did, it was, yeah, I'm sure Susan Stetley testified earlier in the session. It's been a while though. Okay. I'm quite sure that she doesn't like this language. <laughs> but. She did not. She did not like it. <laughs> I'm just wondering about the financial viability of AVIC these days, given the fact that they've had, what, four members, yeah. paying members, um, drop out. Um, another question is uh, the wellness section. Uh, what's the origin of that, if you know it? Yeah, the origin, that was a, a request from a constituent uh, initially, and it dealt with updating the, the um, wellness policies. Um, to conform to a national standard. Um, and that evolved a little bit uh, through committee discussion to actually amend the, sat the statute as well, to expand the definition of wellness, as, it as I briefly mentioned. Uh, and then um, it changed the language about the policy of it as well in terms of how that would be worded. But it came from basically from a constituent. All right, and do you know if, if much testimony was taken on that issue and, it, and how it unfolded? Um, there was testimony. I'm not sure how much of it there was uh, okay. early on, um, again. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, Act 173, UVM, um, and then proficiency-based education. Okay, no, that, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Kathleen. Um, yep, thanks. Uh, just a couple questions. Oh, wait, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Yeah. A um, couple questions. Um, so, Kate, is it? Um, I, I think I had previously heard a couple times, and so anything with an appropriation in it is on hold at this point, right? I, I, I believe that anything with an appropriation is, is going to be sticky right now. Right. Okay. So, so we can assume that, that anything that has money in it in this bill is going to be shuttered, shuttered off to the wayside. Yeah, that, that's going to be right now. That language is in Senate appropriations. Our language for um, literacy is in House appropriations. Yep. Um, I, I would say, and, and likely, um, likely our, our, uh, our construction bill will likely end up in um, appropriations as well. Uh, so we don't, th th those are, are, are decisions to be made by those committees. Okay. So I, um, but it, it's, I think it's an important thing for us to understand. Um, and I think um, I, I can talk with Jim to look at the bills, the vehicles that we have on the wall. Um, that since we don't have possession of this one, but it does have language that looks like it's important that we might be able to, to pull. Does, it, does that sound appropriate to the committee? 
Yeah, I just I just wanted to make sure I was I, I kind of thought um, that in this in this new world um, and appropriately, you know, our job was really going to be to move uh, at this point only bills that are really vital and that don't have any dollars attached. So I, I just wanted to make sure we were all kind of that I was understanding right and that that was sort of our mission. I think that you are understanding right that and other we'll folks. Um, go ahead. Will we talk a little bit later um, about the UVM section or? Yes, we can talk about all of them. I, I, think, um, I think in this bill, we've got the AVIC language, which, um, hearing that there's whether that's something that we should address now, um, whether it's necessary, whether we need testimony. Um, we have, uh, the small schools thing, um, which we've passed in the past, which doesn't have money in it, like something. But this way, um, who has an interest in more on the AVIC section here? I see Coopley, I see Kathleen. Okay, I see, I see a few people nodding. So, so should we, should we? from Susan Stitely then. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk with Jim afterward. Um, maybe Jim and Larry and I can I can talk about what to do about the AVIC piece, whether that we need to move. Um, the next thing is the um, small schools grant related to pre-K. Um, that does seem to be something that we could find a spot for seem appropriate? How about a thumbs up if it seems appropriate for us to address that language? I saw two thumbs, three thumbs, four thumbs. Oh, good. All right. Look at the thumbs. We got the thumb icons. We are so high tech. Okay. So one to address. Um, the well. I don't have any thumbs, but I am, I'm okay. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> We're all Sorry. thumbs. Some of us are all thumbs and some of us are thumbs. Um, so the wellness program, is that something to address now or something that we wait on? I'm seeing some wait ons. So at, at the moment, I'm seeing that we wait on school wellness. At the moment, that's what I'm seeing. We'll, we'll check in with, with folks later about that, but we'll wait on that. Um, Then we have. Um, uh, can, can I interrupt for a second? Please. If, if um, whoever's operating could put us all back on the screen, we could actually see each other. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Okay, good. Um, there's then there's section seven and eight, which have to do with um, the reason we haven't been able to get to check. check to <laughs> uh, I'm. <laughs> I think we can probably find a place for these two items. Seem okay? Okay, so we'll find a place for seven and eight then. Um, section nine, menstrual hygiene products. I'm gonna have folks talk. Um, let, let's talk about that one. I'm gonna have um, Larry and, I, I love this, I'll have Larry and, and Peter talk with, with different individuals about that, which I just love. <laughs> um, whether that's something that we move forward on. Um, section 10 is the census grant um, related to uh, 173, excuse me, it's 173 census grant, grant. I am inclined to say that we find a place for this. Okay. Okay. So find a place for that, uh, Jim. Um, and hey, Kate. Yeah. I had a question for Jim. Back up section three, the oath. Okay. What's the What's the reasoning around getting rid of that, striking that out, and what's it you know kind of for, so to speak? <laughs> 
Well, I think the reason is people just don't think it's necessary. Um, I think that's why. Okay. Okay. It looked like that was put in in the '60s. I think wasn't it? Did I, is that what I saw? That, that's interesting. <laughs> um, I didn't even know they they had to take it out like that. <clears throat> interesting. Okay. Okay, so that gets us through 173. So everything related to 173, um, those sections we want to keep track of. Um, UVM, gender balance. Is that a high needs? <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm seeing the men say no. <laughs> Um, yeah, go ahead, sorry, I couldn't find my hand razor. Um, I just, I want to at least make sure we talk about that. Um, I, I would love to hear from Dylan. I know Dylan, you're on the state college board. Um, I just want to make sure we feel it's, it's urgent. Um, you know, I'm not a co-sponsor of that bill and, um, remembering at the time, um, thinking that, that it was a really important goal, but it, wondering whether it needed to be set in statute. So I just want to make sure that if we feel that's important to move it ahead this year, that we have time to talk about it. Right. It's, it's not, it doesn't fit the COVID urgent. Um, that's for sure. And I, I know I've seen articles saying that it, it seemed like UVM was, you know, maybe moving on this now and taking that seriously, I hope. Like I said, it's not, it's not that I don't think it's an important provision. It's just, I, I, have been wondering from the beginning if it really needs to be a law, you know, set in statute. So I'd love to hear from Dylan on that. Maybe not right now. Yeah. So I'd be, I'd be inclined and I'm, I'm someone, you know, say no, but I'd be inclined to say that that is something that we would need testimony on. And does it, it doesn't fit in the category of urgent. Okay. Um, but we will, we will, it's not something we want to drop. Um, it's something to consider, but um, we don't, it's, we don't necessarily have time for testimony. Kate, if I could just interrupt for a second. Yeah. I do think, you know, since this is a, a public meeting we're having here that yes. those of us who are maybe shaking our head or going like that. Yeah. It, uh, I know for me, a lot of this isn't based on that. I don't think it's an important topic, but it's a lot of it's just based on where we're at and the urgency of, of the other things that are more important. Thank you for that clarity. And I was realizing that because I think this is something that we care about. It's just that it's not meeting the urgency requirement. It's not, a, it's not in the urgent category, but it's important. Yeah, thanks I'm gonna for regret everything I said. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's important that we um, realize that, um, you know, leadership may decide we're only going to do things that are important. Uh, right. So we need to decide that basically, you know, soon. So let's in that light, let's um, let's go through these bills and just get the high level understanding of what's here. And then I. leadership and who is also working with the Senate to see what we actually are going to be able to get through this year um, and see what what we want to be picking up next year. So um, S46, that's still in the Senate as well. Yeah, um, okay. So Avery, can we pull that one up? Uh, okay, um, and scroll down a little bit. Uh, okay, so this this deals with the uh, the um, report on equalized pupils. Uh, so this basically uh, has some findings at the beginning, um, which I think we can skip through. So let's just scroll down a bit. Yeah. 
So this requires, stop here if you were angry, uh, section two uh, requires that the agency uh, in collaboration with the state board and various stakeholders which are listed uh, develop a plan to implement the report's recommendation using one of the mo models, mo sorry, models in that report. So there's a, a table E1 in that report, um, which has weights, um, and uh, that's what they're being asked to um, uh, develop and implement a phase plan around. So if we can scroll down a bit further, um, these are the, um, the things they have to consider uh, as they do that. Uh, so a timeline for it, design uh, to be sensitive to property tax rates, um, consideration of the formulas interaction with other provisions of law. Uh, and then scroll down a bit further, Avery, if you would. Um, uh, so also the state board have not less than six public meetings in different regions of the state to educate and to get input um, on, the, um, on the plan. And then the plan will be delivered in time for uh, you to take action next year to implement. Okay, and that's still in, that's in Senate approach at the moment, right? I'm not sure. Is it, there's no, can you go back to that, that again? Um, Avery? And scroll down further. Uh, yeah, this is an aspirational statement about taking action. There's no appropriation in here. Um, so I'm not sure if it's in appropriations. Well, it says that um, 324 was referred to appropriations. Okay. Rule 31, I don't, I don't know. Um, I was trying to trace bills on the system and it was that giving me good results? Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at it on the um, on the legislative website and it says it was at floor action sent on 324 to appropriations. So 324? This is this is S46. Yep. So I'm looking at. Okay. Okay. It was the one that was labeled an act related to relating to it was it was the old uh, ethnic studies. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I don't know why it was sent to appropriations. Well, because it has significant implications to finance. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And the next one we actually have, which is the after school task force, which has been presented to us. Um, or at least we heard from the Senate. I don't think, did we hear from, I don't think we heard from you. Did we hear from you, Jim? I don't remember. Um, well, let's just go through it again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this one I believe has passed the Senate, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so going past the findings, if we can go down Avery to section two, okay. So this creates a new task force um, uh, to consider make recommendations on the framework for the cost of and the long-term funding sources for access to universal after school programs. So there's a task force, um, if you scroll down further, every uh, usual structure of members are here, the usual suspects are here. Keep going if you would. Yep, keep going. Um, okay, keep going. Yeah, you keep going to the next page. Yeah, okay, if you pause here uh, on the powers and duties, um, uh, sorry, go up a little bit, uh, Avery, sorry. Go up to, yeah, go up, up to, to the previous page, page four. Okay, pause. Uh, 
I'll go up a bit further, sorry, one more page. Let's try to get to the power, powers and duties. Okay, that's good, stop there. Thanks. Okay, so powers and duties of the task force, uh, um, specifically mapping existing programs, having gaps in access, et cetera, uh, recommending uh, best practices and key evidence-based strategies to maximize health and substance abuse prevention. Um, considering a report that was done earlier, if we can scroll down every just a bit, uh, for to review the SASH results of um, a grant program, and then to explore all finding sources. Uh, and if we scroll down a bit further, it says shall prefer solutions that do not drop on the state's education fund. Um, and uh, and then the reports do back uh, uh, December 15th. This one had something about not using the ed fund, I think. Yeah. Trying to find other sources. So initially, this bill came out of committee with a preference for using uh, revenue from the cannabis tax and regulate, assuming it eventually passes. Uh, but that was uh, that was taken out on the floor. And uh, rather than having a specific mention of cannabis, it just said what it says now um, above, which isn't, isn't on the screen, but basically to explore funding sources that don't impact the education fund. Okay. Does this need the, I'm, I'm just looking for that. So this does not need the S54, which, was, which is the cannabis bill. It, it doesn't need it as it's drafted now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We wouldn't have needed it even as it passed out of the of STEM education because the task force is only being asked to look at solutions for funding uh, with a preference toward using cannabis tax if it eventually comes to be. But anyway, that, that language was struck. Okay. Questions? Kathleen, do you have a question? I can't tell if I'm... I did have a question, but my dog is barking. So <laughs> I withdrew my question. Um, my only question was, it's, it looks like the only appropriation in this uh, for this task force would be the per diem for the members. Correct. Thanks. Okay, I might be behind here. I just want to make sure. Um, Representative Matos, did you have a question? No, okay. Um, Representative Conlon? Did you uh, have a question? Uh, just um, why wasn't the, the per diem appropriation calculated on this? Or did I just not see it? Oh, can we go back to it? Sure. Yeah, we're sorry. Let's go back to the very end of the bill. Keep going. Okay, stop here. Next, number two. Um, from funds available uh, from appropriation. So there's funds available in uh, another appropriation <coughs> that they're using for this purpose. Th that are available today? Yes. From 2018, okay. 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 I think there's some funding questions that still remain on that on that one. Um, Sarita, and then Larry. It's too late to get some students on the task force. Mm -hmm. That would be something that we would discuss. Okay. Thank you. Um, so students. Yeah. Okay. And um, Larry. Yeah, Peter. Uh, um, I was going to ask the same question, so we're good there with the funding issue. 
Okay. Um, so we're, we're thinking about all these, <laughs> these bills that we're gonna do. Um, and then there's the S-166, which is the State Board of Ed bill. Okay. Looks like it's so a lot of this bill, um, S-166, it's a long bill, it's about 60 pages long. Um, I think I'll just talk about, about it at this stage rather than going through it. Um, yeah. So this bill does a couple of things. Um, the board of the, the chair of the State Board of Education um, initiated uh, this bill uh, with um, Senator Ruth. And the goal is to move functions that the uh, state board is not able to perform because it has no staff uh, over to the agency, which is actually, in fact, performing those functions. Um, so what this bill do does is it takes um, today, let me back up, today, uh, all rulemaking authority lies with the State Board of Education. Uh, what this bill does is it moves rulemaking authority from the State Board to the Agency of Education uh, for a variety of topics. So uh, about two thirds of the State Board's rulemaking authority will be moved from the State Board to the Agency of Education. Uh, and then the other thing it does is it, um, as a general theme, it has the agency of education uh, implement, implementing uh, rules. So again, the state board, even if they adopt a rule, they don't have the staff to implement even the rules they adopt. So the idea is to, um, is to clarify that the agency will be carrying out basically uh, those functions. So those are the two themes, uh, basically moving will make the authority over to the agency and having the execution function uh, aligned with that more toward the agency where they've got the staff to do it. And this bill here is a compromise position between the, uh, uh, the um, chair of the state board and the secretary of education. Uh, and this language with a few exceptions was agreed to by both. And then where there were a couple of disagreements, uh, the Senate Education Committee took a view. And, uh, and that's what this bill rep represents. So the disagreement areas were, do you remember? Uh, quite small. Um, so the main, main one is just, it's a, form, it's a really a format issue. Um, it's how, when you get to the powers and duties section, how the rulemaking authority is, um, is addressed. Uh, the results are the same either way, but they have different ways of get, getting to the same conclusion. So it's really about how the words are expressed, not the outcome. What, what happens if we don't move on it this year? Uh, well, nothing changes, obviously, for at least a year. This will go into effect uh, upon passage or July 31 of this year. Okay. So um, it would have to wait for a year. But in fact, what this bill does, in large part, well, the rulemaking is different. Changing, giving the agency rulemaking authority is new. But a lot of what this bill does is just reflect reality. Um, right. Um, yes, because most of the most of the statutes related to the fact when we had a, a, a commissioner rather than an agency department rather than an agency. Okay. All right, we're gonna to need to hear from them to find out the need to move on it now versus waiting, which is I think our, our question on everything before us is how much needs to be now and how much can wait. All right. I think that's it. So we have S226, right? Can I just ask um, a question on the yeah, last yeah, one? Uh, uh, so there's no danger that the state board will be sunsetted if we don't pass this? 
I don't believe that passed in the, that was being looked at by, was it government ops or I can't remember which committee was looking at that, but I'm not sure that stands, but I, I don't think that was being Yeah, forward. it was government ops because. Okay, so so that we don't have, I guess we just need to clarify whether we have a concern whether the state board would be sunsetted if another bill passed and this didn't. So there was, a, a, some of that broke up, but we did pass, um, remember the, the GovOps bill that we passed on the floor, it was I think on Thursday or Friday that um, okay. Caleb spoke to on the advisory panel. Um, oh, right. And so that did not have anything about the state board in it? I don't think it did, but, but okay. we can take a look at that one. Because we had spoken about taking that out. Okay. We working on it. Right. And the, Jim, I, the language I like that... Avery, I mean, Caleb? I was just going to say the uh, language that um, we use for, and I'm going to get the numbers mixed up now, but for what basically was the the Senate special ed bill that had previously been, and I think it was H650 or whatever it was that came out of GovOps. That was the one where a previous draft had struck the State Board of Education. So I think that's the most recent time we kind of saw that language. But in fact, we wound up taking everything out of that bill that pertained to education um, and going, because it was really just about that special ed advisory language. So um, anyway, the, just, that that was i think the most recent place the house had a draft that included that uh sbe um language i just got verification that 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 was that they had a, a provision in the introduced bill to sunset the state board of ed and we took that out okay. so so there would be no change or they would not be sunsetted and this would not go in so that's another point of discussion for us um, as we're looking at the things that we must do and the things that we'd like to do and the things that can wait. And there's no money in this for staffing the state board, right? No I believe, okay. Thank you. I believe that there was a go I believe that the state board was looking to have some support um, in hallway conversation. Okay. There's one more bill, there's S226. Right. Avery, do you have that one? Great, thank you. Okay, so this bill um, is S226 and it deals with uh, state public school employee benefits. Um, and um, if you scroll down a bit, um, yeah, that's good to be right there. Um, so what happened was as part of the first year of statewide negotiation of healthcare benefits for school employees, uh, there were some issues that came up on both sides that they wanted to have clarified. So the language in this bill reflects an, an agreement um, I believe I can say that an agreement between the Vermont NEA um, and the um, uh, the reps for the um, employers. Um, uh, so, without going to, to a lot of detail here, uh, the first part of this language here deals with definitions because the original bill had um, inadvertently excluded certain, certain employees of schools. Um, so basically, um, if you scroll down a bit further, Avery, um, so school employee meet, includes the following indi individuals, and Avery, if you scroll down half a page, yeah, uh, go up a bit further, sorry, too far. Yeah, so we're listing out who is included here. So the certified, a certified employee, for example, have been excluded by mistake. So that's now put back in. And then um, all other permanent employees are included now. And then it excludes uh, the role of a super, the, the person who serves as a superintendent. 
uh, given the fact that they really are management. Um, so they've been excluded from, from um, being included in the covered employees here. Um, if you scroll down further um, until you find some underlined or striked language, right here is good. Um, this is just cleaning up some definitional is is issues. So that's a very technical change. You go further, if you would. Uh, yep, keep going. Uh, okay, uh, if you pause here, um, D allows members of the commission, you may recall the commission has um, five members uh, who represent school employers and five members who rep represent school employees. Um, and um, this says now that th those members can re be removed by whoever appointed them without cause. So if they're not representing their side as well as they could, they could be re removed without cause. Before this language was added, it could only be they could only be removed by with cause by the commission. So if we scroll down further, Avery, just keep looking for underlined or struck language. Okay, uh, down here, um, stop there if you would. Uh, um, so one of the issues is that they weren't getting paid <laughs> um, for their service. So this clarifies that um, they can get paid for up to 10 meetings a year. And then we'll come on to a section that has an appropriation for that later on. Uh, release time, this requires schools to release employees to serve on the commission. Uh, so that's new. If you scroll down further, Avery. Um, and yeah, go down to J here, right there. So alternate members, this allows, uh, in addition to the five members on each side, that to be four alternate members could be appointed. So um, that's up to two uh, rep, alternate, member, alternate members for school employees, up to two alternate members for school employers. Um, and the purpose there obviously is they can be at the meetings and if somebody drops out, they'll, they'll, they'll carry on, just like often jurors would be on a jury. So if we scroll down further, Avery, um, appropriations here, so, uh, okay. So there's a $17,500 $17, appropriation to cover um, uh, per diem and uh, reimbursement for commission members. And then go down further if you would, uh, to the next strikeout right here. Um, so line three being struck here uh, it had required that the um, the premium and out of pocket responsibility percentages uh, for each plant tier be the same for all employees. So same for a janitor as for a superintendent. Um, this allows that to be negotiated. So perhaps you have a, a lower share by a janitor, for example, making less money as compared to assuming more highly paid. So it makes the, the premium percentages negotiable or before they could, be, they could not be negotiated. So we don't go down further, Avery, if you would. Um, you can keep going, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, line three here being, being struck is the same concept for our pocket. Above was for uh, premiums. Uh, if you can go further, Avery, uh, right here. So up, up, up a bit, sorry. Just up to the underlying language right there. Um, and then this allows the commission to negotiate a statewide grievance procedure for disputes. Um, uh, so that was added. And then um, the language uh, on line eight uh, requires a bit earlier engagement in terms of the, the negotiating process. Um, let's go down further, Avery, to find more struck or underlined language. Uh, right here. Um, these are very technical changes. Um, during the bargaining last year, the arbitrator allowed people to submit information after they were supposed to. So this clarifies that you can't do that. Um, you can't modify your last best offers post-hearing. Um, 
and um, and then down further requires um, there be cost estimates included in, in the OSS offers. Um, then going down further, Avery, uh, yeah, right here, this requires that the decision by the arbitrator explain in appropriate detail the rationale for the uh, selecting the last best offer on the last round. Evidently, the explanation was very minimal, um, so they want more information. If you could keep going, I think that's it, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Questions? And this, this one here has passed the set, but it hasn't been compiled yet. So there were a couple of floor amendments on this, I believe. Yeah. And, um, but it hasn't been compiled into a, a official version yet. Oh, I'm sorry. So we don't have that in our committee now. It's, well, it's not yet because it hasn't passed. It has passed the Senate actually, uh, but it hasn't been sent over to you yet. Okay. Okay. So it's just mattered. It hasn't been messaged over. I think so. Okay. And I, I guess, um, so, uh, okay, Representative Conlon, you have a question? No. Um, what happens if we don't pass this this year? What's, what's the, as we're trying to look at the end through the lens of what's, what's, what's a, a must pass and what's a would like to pass, um, is there something, is this in the must pass or it sure would be fabulous to pass <laughs> or it could wait? And I know you're supposed to say neutral, but um, oh, I guess I'm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you'd want to hear from the two sides on that. Yeah. I, I do because you know, they'll, they'll have views and yeah. there is an appropriation here too, of course. Yeah, so it was sent over with the appropriation in it. Yeah. Okay. It, it may be one well, of the questions that we'll have to ask, because I'm not quite sure of the answer, but I think they negotiated a two year. Um, well, I don't know. Never mind. We'll have to get some more information. Yeah. Sarita? And then Larry? I, I was going to ask the same question about when are people negotiating, because I would think if it doesn't pass, it could impact negotiations. I'm not sure the timing is um, for Boston, so I can't answer that. Representative Cooper? Yeah, Jim, um, <clears throat> what about the amendments? Did you say the, did the amendments, have they been included in this bill or? No, they... what you said did not include the amendments. One of them was very technical. There are two sections. What happened in this bill was I included the whole chapter because the two sides were negotiating during the committee discussion. The one didn't see all the language, but the two sections that did get did not get amended were still in the bill, but they shouldn't be because they weren't changed. So those two got struck just as a technical matter on the floor. And then the other one, I can't remember what the other one was. Um, I have to go back and look, but it was quite minor too. It was not like a major, major change. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, Representative Elder. So um, my feeling on this one is that uh, basically, if if both sides were at the at the table, I guess in the Senate committee, so to speak. You know, my understanding is we just had our first year of statewide healthcare bargaining. It went to arbitration. As I read this bill, I think I'm seeing that it's some technical fixes to that. So just uh, regarding Sarita's point about the timing that, that again, this, the timing would be for the next statewide um, arbitration process and bargaining process for health care. So it seems to me that this would be a good one to move um, 
just since that statewide bargaining process is new and it seems natural to me that some you know some things would pop up after just having done such a large change as to bargain that statewide and that uh, if the senate has really you know done enough work on this that it, it's not coming to us trailing a lot of controversy and it does seem um like something might move move through but i would want to you know have the bill presented to us or something by you know just sort of understand the the context a little more but um generally i'm supportive of this kind of bill which seems to me following on the heels of you the say change, that what it could be trying to make effect. some some important fixes to sorry say that again so so then what you're seeing is that this could with this unsettled could have some impact on arbitration that will be coming up upcoming yeah i assume so it's like i i, I it's it seems that uh it's probably trying to smooth out the process as it goes primarily with that said i imagine that the process could stay in place for another year um so i i guess i'm just interested to see is this a bill that everyone's in agreement, these are good fixes, or is it, again, just kind of, on all of these, it would be good to sort of have a temperature check of the sense of how hot is this item? And um, because urgency, if it's um, really one-sided urgency, I think is it will be hard, you know, harder to move quickly on, that's for sure. Right. Thank you, Representative James. Yep, just want to um, follow along to what Caleb was saying, um, which is that if, if we're going to move on this, I, I want to hear testimony or at least see written testimony from both sides so that we're assured that they both agree that these changes are going to improve um, the arbitration process and that this isn't a, you know, a controversial bill in, in any way. If everybody agrees this is going to make the arbitration, the new arbitration process better, let's move it. But I want to hear that directly. Okay, that's great. This is helpful. Um, thank you very much. I think we are at a rest point. We have um, the superintendent. No, we have we have uh, so, uh, some groups coming in this afternoon. Um, one is from the Independent Schools Association related to special education schools, and then we will hear from the school boards the principals, the council of special education administrators, the NEA and the superintendents, just to get another um, update, which I'll be looking at a weekly update from them. And in the meantime, um, Larry, why don't you and I have a chat about these bills to figure out uh, how we want to organize it going forward for the committee so we can determine what's, what's a, a must pass, what's a you know, put a scale of one to five. Um, you want to uh, phone? Yeah, we can we can check in later. I'll just check right. in with you. 